Today's guest in the trenches with Dave Lapham, brought to you by First Star Logistics, is Tom Thayer, color analyst on the Bears Radio Network. Played high school football in Illinois, went to Notre Dame, went to the USFL, played for the Chicago Blitz and, and um, George Allen in Chicago, and then came to the Chicago Bears. Played on the 85 Bears. Dot Bears, a lot of great stories there. He knows the Chicago Bears inside and out. Be interesting to hear. What Tom Thayer thinks are the keys to the football game, Bears, Bengals on the lake in Chicago. Once again, we're in the beautiful First Star Logistics studios. You're in the trenches with Dave Lapham and our guest. Big time. This is big time. Tom Thayer. 1985 Chicago Bears starting guard, the Bears. I, that's the first thing I guess I want to talk ask you about. Illinois high school football player, go to Notre Dame, 85 Bears. Man, your football life was good, my man. <laughs> well, you know, Dave, um, a lot like us as you know, young linemen and stuff, I took a chance because I went to the USFL Right. right out of college because I wanted to stay in Chicago. It meant a lot to me. I was the youngest in my family and, you know, kind of had a chance to keep everybody together. George Allen came out and sold the Chicago Blitz to me. I felt like I was going to have an opportunity to play for a Hall of Fame coach. And I, I enjoyed it. You know, I had a great experience. I learned a lot about football. Um, our defensive line coach at the time was John Tierlink. And he was a guy... Dave, that, you know, he wanted you there every day. He was a defensive line coach. I was an offensive lineman. But every single day after practice, I stood out there and took a half hour of one-on-ones. And, um, you know, he he really helped develop a lot of confidence in me as a young guy. So when I made the transition from the USFL to the NFL, I he felt, I felt, in George Allen, because he had an association to the Bears, wanted me to be prepared so when I went back into the NFL that there was a good reflection on the USFL that they got me prepared to play immediately. That's great. Tell me about the 1985 Bears. I mean, if you had to just thumbnail sketch, summarize what that 1985 Bears team was all about, and I guess it's hard to do in just a little, a few words, but what's, what's your biggest memory? What comes to mind first and foremost? The biggest thing I remember, because, I, you know, I grew up as a Bears fan my whole life, and I was kind yeah. of an NFL hero worshiper. And when I got into the huddle the first time and I looked across, directly across the huddle from me stood Walter Payton. <laughs> and I was, I was so enamored with Walter and everything that he was able to accomplish up to that point in the NFL. Um, you know, I, I felt important. I felt like the reason I was on that offensive line was the block for Walter Payton. And I remember the first time got in there, we went to nine on seven. They called the slant 45. And that was just an old basic combination block with Keith Van Horn that we were instrumental in the success of the play for Walter. And I remember breaking the huddle and turning around. And there's McMichael, Hampton, Singletary, Otis, Richard. You know, that 85 defense was staring me in the face. And Ditka was getting Buddy Ryan riled up. Ryan, Buddy Ryan was getting his defense riled up. <laughs> and I was saying, okay, man, this is serious stuff. I don't care if it's practice. This is the real deal. And so it's just, uh, you know, the uh, mentality Ditka wanted you to have as a football player, um, what that defense was all about, and the fact that it was a really an important role on that offensive line to um, – make it um, a success for Walter Payton. I guess probably game day was almost a vacation after working against that defense all during the week. I mean, that defense, man, it was, it was impressive to say the least. Was it like that? I mean, was it iron sharpening iron, you guys working against each other? And then game day, it was like, man, we can handle just about anything. Yeah, you know, we went live in practice. It was no bull crap. It was, it was cutting. It was full speed. It was – you know, take no prisoners type. Some of the best fights that I've ever seen in football was on Wednesday and Thursday after and during nine on seven. 
And so it was the real deal. You're exactly right. When we got to the games, there are some times that the game that we are playing was slower paced than the practices yeah. that we are facing on Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays weren't easy, but Fridays certainly weren't Wednesday or Thursday practice. I had an experience like that when uh, Tim Crumry came into the league <laughs> with the Cincinnati Bengals. That dude was like, <laughs> there was no half speed. There was no three quarter speed. Either you were out or you were in a hundred percent, you know? And it's like, it was my 10th year in the league. And I'm like, Tim, I, I don't know if I, this is like playing 150 games, dude, if you don't like it, you know, retire. You know, it's like, <laughs> he just, that, that guy was, uh, all business, man. And, uh, it was, it was impressive and, and it really brought out the best in you. There's no question about it. As long as you can survive physically. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I knew I became a fan of crumb ride because we came out of college the same year. Oh, and so okay. I knew of him, I knew of him throughout his whole college career, but we also played in the hula bowl together. Oh. And so he he's not a guy that brought these courtesy hula bowl practices to work. <laughs> he's the kind of guy that you're going, what's going on here? Right. I mean, this this dude's bringing it in these, you know, these these <laughs> casual practices out in uh, Hawaii. But then again, you go out and you look the career he had, the recovery from the ankle injury. So with with Crumry, I know exactly what you're talking about. Oh man, I can imagine the uh, the hula bowl. He wasn't there for the fun in the sun, man. <laughs> There's no question uh -uh, about that. No, I had uh, I went I played in the hula bowl, and Bo Schembechler was our coach. <sighs> I mean, he he worked as hard in practice too, and uh, you know the, the we were the east, the west was out enjoying the sun, half hour practice. We beat him like 35 to nothing. I mean, it was it wasn't even the contest, you know. We were we were ready to roll and they were ready to party. It was it was classic, but that's fun stuff. All right. So let's let's fast forward a bunch here to the to this football team, the Chicago Bears, and and the opponent uh this week for you up in Chicago. Your home opener is the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh what's it gonna be like to have a crowd in full throat for the first time in a while for a home opener? Is it gonna be a wild scene up there? You know, I tell you, Dave, pay attention. It's going to be a weird scene because if the Bears go out and they start fast and they have a uh, really, you know, uh, offensive drive that, uh, can, you know, finishes in points, then you're going to see a supportive crowd on, you know, that's going to get behind the Bears. If they start on a defense and they let Cincinnati go down, right, go right down and get some points themselves, you're going to hear a reflection in booze probably. But then we're going to have to figure out if Andy Dalton goes out there and plays well, I think the crowd will get behind him. If he's not playing well and then they insert Justin Fields in for a series, a play, whatever the case may be, you're going to hear the crowd just are going to be on their feet, you know, applauding the entrance of Justin Fields, maybe like a stadium you've never heard before. But, you know, this is 61,500. It's a stadium where the noise really doesn't stay inside, but it can get loud in there. So it's all going to be reflective of the quarterback position and the performance of the defense is the crowd that you're going to hear. Talk about that, the quarterback position. Uh, Justin Fields, he, he little zone read, touchdown run, and went two for two for 10 yards, was in for a half a dozen plays. Do you anticipate the package that they've got for Justin Fields increasing almost on a week-by-week -week basis till he eventually takes over? Is it almost impossible to tell at this point? I, I think they would be foolish not to feed Justin as much information as they possibly could on a weekly, weekly basis. I think you have to go out there and look at the vulnerabilities of your opponent and see how Justin best fits into the plan. And you know what? I'm not taking away from anything from Andy Dalton because he did a nice job in L.A. He was yep. in control of the snap count. He threw the ball well. He made some good decisions. But, you know, and I kind of feel bad because when they went and signed Andy Dalton, they had no idea they were going to be in position to draft Justin. But as soon as they drafted Justin Fields, and you see the way the other quarterbacks have fallen into place uh, so far this season, everybody got on their, you know, got on their soapbox and started, uh, you know, cheering and pulling and wanted Justin to be in, in the system. And so I think each year, each week is going to be a different challenge. If Andy goes out there and plays well, and they get some points on the board, I think you're going to see can, you're going to see support for Andy, but you're going to see them pulling for Justin to get more opportunities. And everything that Justin has shown throughout training camp, 
his athleticism, his arm strength, his accuracy, his commitment to the position. Uh, it's going to be an exciting time here. It's going to be an exciting run when he finally does get more snaps and more reps. So I hope and I think that you'll see multiple plays for Justin because just in inserting him for a play now and again, I don't think the offensive line can get in tune with his snap count cadence. Last week when you saw him, Andy Dalton was in the game. They put in Justin. The tight end jumped. And so, you know, as an offensive lineman, you got to be familiar with that rhythm in this, the rhythm of the snap count. And so this week when they are at home and he, the cadence can be more of a weapon, I, I, I think there will be more opportunities for Justin to succeed. What about the locker room? Uh, when you have a quarterback situation, I don't want to call it controversy, but a quarterback situation like this, sometimes it can splinter and divide a locker room. Is, is the locker room okay about the way it's uh, unfolding and the way it's happening between these two? You know, at 0-1 right now, the locker room is okay, but you're exactly right. I do think it could, could create some friction inside the locker room if the players think that their best opportunity to win is with Justin. It's going to become evident. And so I think Matt Nagy has to gain and keep the respect of the locker room by making the right decision for the future of the players and the Bears. Um, so I think a lot will be decided within the first four or five weeks. If they go out and they're 0-4, I think it's going to become the Justin Fields story. If they go out there and they stay competitive and they uh, put an offense on the field that can be um, kind of two-sided, a two-headed competitive situation, difficult for the opponent's defensive coordinator to prepare for, I think they could stay along that course until they feel Justin has complete command of this offense. And then once he does – it's going to be the Justin Field show from there on out. But um, I, I think, you know, you you brought up a really important point. It's about making sure you, you keep everybody in that locker room uh, on the same page and everybody pulling in the same direction. Pace and Nagy, when they were recruiting, you know, Andy Dalton to come to the Bears, I mean, word is that Andy Dalton as a free agent was had other opportunities in, in am I going to get a fair shot to be the starter? Uh, okay, well, no, I'm going to move on. And I'm not saying that they promised as such, you know, I mean, maybe they did, who knows, but if they did say you're our starting quarterback, they both seem to be men of their word kind of thing. Is, is, is that pretty much what took place with Andy Dalton as far as you know? Well, you know, I, I, I don't think they necessarily had a promise to him. They said, Hey man, you're good. You got, you have a great experience. You've really showed, how diligent you work. You did a nice job in Dallas in a moment's notice. And then Dave, social media, they went out there and they anointed him QB one. Right. And that kind of picked up a lot of steam in the everyday media um, pressers with want with a um, uh, pace and Matt Nagy. They started to ask him about it and then they had to stand behind it. And once they stood behind it, this was Andy's job to lose. And then all of a sudden on draft night, a crazy thing happened when Justin, they got the opportunity to trade up and get it, uh, Justin Fields and it changed the whole narrative. But Matt and Ryan Pace never changed. And I don't, I think they were smart about it. You can't just give someone a job because you drafted him. You got to make him earn it. You got to show, uh, you have to tell him that he needs to respect the opportunity in which Justin showed perfectly. And he had a strong training camp and never really lost the job. So mm -hmm. now it's Justin's job to earn. And uh, I think the message was clear that they had every intentions of starting uh, Andy when they brought him in here. So let's talk about the people that protect the quarterback. Who's going to play left tackle? Have they talked to you about, you know, coming out of the booth and uh, throwing the pads on? <laughs> no, they, they called Jimbo Covert after his Hall of Fame speech. They said, hey, Jimbo, what do you think? No, you know, they brought in, they signed Elijah Wilkinson. And so right. he was one of the guys that was, you know, played the entire offseason, all OTAs, all mandatory minicamp, all training camp, um, and showed signs that he's got clever of enough feet to hold play the position. But he's not a dominant left tackle in the NFL. And they so they brought in Jason Peters. They drafted Larry Borum in the fifth round out of Missouri, who, right. to me, he's this guy showed that he's got the skill to be a starting left tackle for the long term in the NFL. Unfortunately, he was fell on in the game, 
and had the high ankle sprain. Now you don't know how long it's going to be for him. But yeah. Elijah Wilkinson is going to be the guy that's going to play left tackle. I think they'll probably concentrate uh, with a big group of tight ends between Jimmy Graham and Cole Komet and J.P. Holtz and Jesper Horstead and Jesse James. They got a bunch of guys that they can surround him with and uh, allow him to gain a little confidence at that left tackle position and try to hold down the fort until they get a feeling of where Jason's at or where uh, Borum will eventually be at. So Jason's got a quad, Borum's got an ankle. Um, that's that's tough. When you, And it seems to always hit like one position gets annihilated by injury. You know, it's crazy how it goes in the league. A guy that, that – I watch a little bit and have a lot of respect for his white hair. I, white hair, man, he gets after it, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. And, you know, Cody Whitehair has got a little bit of experience of playing left tackle, but right. you know, he's gone from center to right guard to left guard. Now he's holding down the four at left guard and playing some big, strong football up there. But if you had to slide him over to left tackle at a moment's notice, you probably could. However, they have a guy from Notre Dame, uh, Alex Bars who played a, a couple of years ago, he played left tackle at Notre Dame. He was played center last year during a, a COVID incident where he had to come in and play without any ever playing the position before. And he was able to go in there and, and perform solidly. So, you know, if they had to go to the DEFCON 4, DEFCON, whatever, DEFCON high or low, um, you know, if they had to put him in there to play left tackle, he would be able to. He's got the size. He's got the length. He's got the intelligence. He's got the 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 at the length, the athleticism, and everything. So if they got into a desperate situation, he could play it. Running back Montgomery, Cincinnati kid out of Mount Healthy High School, went to Iowa State. I, I think he's a very underrated guy. I mean, I think people are starting to figure out about him, but I mean. This guy now, he he packs a punch. He'll he'll either run you over, you know, and run away from you, or juke you and run away from you. I, I think this guy's pretty special. Hey, he's a three down stud. You know, he's the type of guy that any down and distance you could have him in the game, and he could play his role. If you bring a blitzer, he's willing to step up and plant his helmet right in your chest. Last week, he pops his finger out, comes to the sideline, gets his finger popped back in, goes in, carries the ball the next play and runs over a linebacker. So uh, I, I love Dave Montgomery, and I think he's the he's the one of the real leaders of the offense, but he's the, uh, he's a leader in the backfield, and they brought in Damian Williams, and they're a really nice one-two punch, but Montgomery is a fully committed football player, a lot like Walter, that Walter would be proud of him because he, because he is a three-down back. Allen Robinson, another guy that I think doesn't get enough credit around the league. This dude, all he does is catch footballs, and, I mean, he, he's a contested catch nightmare. That, that, that guy, it's not 50-50 with him. It's like, you know, 80-20. It, that guy is unbelievable with contested catches, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Uh, he's, you know, he's a great leader on this team, playing under the franchise tag. I think making 17 million bucks this year. Be, on, how would it be to make a million bucks a game? You know, we didn't we didn't make that in two or three seasons. However, <laughs> he's always he's he's unbelievable work ethic, man. I love this guy. You know, it would be different if he was a type of guy that had world class speed. And if he turned it though, you know, contested catches into 40, 50, and 60 yard touchdowns, he'll go out and he'll make you a hundred and something catches a year. Um but he's never going to be the burner wide number one wide receiver that we all hope to have. But dedicated football player, he shows up every week. He's a great leader of the wide receiver room. Uh, it, it is a Rob, and I, I love him. Have him on the team. I'm glad he resigned. I would resign him to a new contract of a respectable amount of money. Can I pay him as the number one or number two receiver in the league? I'm not so sure of that. But he's, mm -hmm. he's an asset for any team he plays on. Let's go to the uh, defensive side, unless there's anything else offensively. You mentioned the tight ends. I mean, Jimmy Graham's a freak. There's, the tight ends are, are threats as well. The tight end package is formidable. It is. You know, I think a guy you got to pay attention to is Cole Komet. I don't know yep. name. Second year, yep. didn't have any training camp last year. Second half of the season, his reps really picked up. Became the starting tight end this year. To me, he had... Uh, five catches on seven targets last week. I would, I would focus on getting him 10, 10 targets a week and never having anything less. He, uh, 
He's got a big catch radius. He's willing to run over you. He's got a good blocker, knows how to wham block on the inside of the defensive line. So everything you want out of a young, developing tight end that you can keep him in there on any down and distance, Cole's that guy. Defensively, of course, you went up against a buzzsaw with, with the Rams. I mean, they're they're so explosive, and they hit a couple of big plays, you know, 67-yard touchdown, another one that was big yards as well. And um, the Chicago Bears, they're not used to giving up big plays like that in the same game. You know, it's that, that's an aberration. Other than that, uh, that big play part of it, how did they play on a snap-by-snap -snap basis against the Rams? And, and how, how do you project this defense to play this year? They get a lot of – every level has almost a Pro Bowl caliber player. There's no question about it. Well, you know, they have a young defensive coordinator that's never called a game before until last right. week, and Sean Desai. He's right. got a, a really bright mind and puts a lot of effort into the game. He's got a lot of experience with Vic Fangio and Chuck Pagano. That's going to be the interesting stage of stage one, the Rams game – to stage two this week at home and, and how he calls the game, hopefully more aggressively. Um, you know, they, they do have stars, you know, Keem Hicks will be backed up by Khalil Mack that will go to Roquan Smith, but the, the, you know, there's question marks at the cornerback, the nickel cornerback. And now because of the plays they gave up last week, the safety positions got to get on the same page. But when you look at the game, the Rams only ran 50 offensive plays, and they right. had three three kneel downs. So <laughs> it's not like they ran over the Bears for 75, 80 plays and scored all over the place. Every time the Bears would try to get back in the game, then they would have a miscue in the defensive backfield that would result in a touchdown, and the Bears were playing catch-up football again. If the Bears would have scored on that first drive, when they got down inside the five-yard line, then they had the penalty set back and then interception. It may have been a different story, but a lot of it is making, you know, try to figure out a way to put Khalil Mack in different places to keep the offense, the offensive line, the offensive coordinator guessing. If you put him out there in the same spot every single play, you know how to slide your protection. You know how to attack him with multiple bodies. You know how to get the back in there to check Khalil so he doesn't have a free rush. But yep. then that, op that opens up Robert Quinn on the other side. If you're going to get one-on-ones every every play, every day, you better be able to kind of, you know, get some pressure, get some, uh, you know, make use of yourself when there's three bodies dedicated to Khalil. It, over the years, Hicks has been a beast. Is he still playing at that level? That that dude has been like a handful. <laughs> you know, if you can figure out a scheme, I, w I was watching Cincinnati. It looked like they were playing some bare defense. And if you could go and put Akeem Hicks on the nose in a bare defense where the center can't have help from either side, he can take any center and drive him into the quarterback's lap. <laughs> and to me... That's what I would do, though. I, I would have him dedicated to a one-on-one -on -one and say, Akeem, don't worry about anything else. You take that guy and drive him into the backfield, and you cut the field in half for the offense, and he would be able to do it. Um, the, the guy is a beast. Uh, you, know, um, you know, both of us having the fear of playing against Reggie White, he has, <laughs> he has that type of off-the-line-of-scrimmage power. Wow. Now, if they could formulate that plan, put him in a bare defense, let him control the center, let him try to cut the field in half and the other playmakers, the other 10 guys, you know, make up the, you know, you know, stop the stop the play and let Akeem be the play destructor. So in your conversations with uh, coaches or players or whatever, and I know it's tough, we don't get as much access to the locker room as we, as we have uh, with the protocols and everything, but what do you think? the feeling is about the Cincinnati Bengals, this week's opponent that is uh, going up to Chicago for your home opener? Uh, you know, a lot of the conversation is about, you know, the two defensive, that they re-signed Hubbard and you brought in Hendrickson. Um, and I, I think because of the fear of the way the offensive tackle position is playing and, you know, if Andy Dalton's in there, he's that directly behind center type of quarterback. If right. you put Justin in there, maybe he can challenge – the contain respect of the defensive ends. But I think right now the message is um, left tackle, left tackle, left tackle. You know, they 
let Charles Leno Jr. go just out of the finances of the position. And they never, they didn't have anybody that played left tackle. They brought, they signed a uh, draft of Tevin Jenkins. He went in for back surgery immediately. Then they bring in 39 year old Jason Peters. So it's all about protecting the quarterback. And, you know, to me is, yeah, a lot of fancy conversation is not dedicated to the offense and defensive line. Usually it's one of the star studded positions on the outside. And what is it? O- Oben, Oben Joby. Ogan Joby, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, you know, the dude is playing strong, powerful, you know, yep. first first game of the year football. And so now if you can't dedicate everybody over to the left tackle position, now you're asking for him to compete in one-on-ones all the time. It kind of creates that interior void too. And um, so I, I think it's going to be a lot about – what do they have to do to adjust to make sure the left tackle position can hold up all of its responsibilities? Are you losing a tight end going out on routes? Do you have to dedicate Dave Montgomery and Damian Williams out of the backfield to make sure that you give that check before you go out or stay in and help protect? And now if you're taking a receiver out of the route, I, I think the respect for Cincinnati defense even you know goes up. And why, why did Minnesota jump? three out of their first seven or four out of their first seven plays. I know the crowd noise had to be big time in, in the Cincinnati stadium, but you know, I, I see that too. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I, think, I think it was a factor, but man, I, they, they honestly, uh, I, they were, they were antsy for whatever reason and ham, you know, the pro bowl fullback, he jumped twice early. He, they took him out of the game. I mean, it, it was it was almost unexplainable what was uh what was going on there and that in that game, 12, 13 penalties. I mean, the uh, Bengals defensive line forced six holding penalties on the Minnesota Vikings. And then both tackles get called for uh, lining up too far in the backfield off the line of scrimmage, trying to widen the angle, you know, and and they got uh, caught with the hand in the cookie jar there on each side of it. So, I mean, they were squarely in the the old linemen's heads of the Minnesota Vikings. The defensive line forced eight penalties. And then, you know, not to mention plays that they made. So the Bengals' defensive line really uh, really had an impact on the football game. What about you know, the I, I, real quick, I, I remember going into the locker room after games that we took a beat and then all the offensive line would say, hey, man, let's just stick together because, you know, Dick is coming after us. And I was thinking of Mike Zimmer in my head, you know, <laughs> going to the locker room either at halftime or after the game. And those guys, <laughs> man, you better stay close because he can't get you all at once. <laughs> You're exactly right. That's that's a that's a great great point. Mm-hmm. What about the all important special teams? I mean, Santos, what twenty seven straight field goals, a club record. He hit thirty field goals out of thirty two attempts. I think it was last year for like ninety two plus percent. They're all records. Obviously, you got yourself a kicker. How about the other phases of special teams? Uh, punter is good. Uh, Patrick O'Donnell, he can put it anywhere. You know, he he's got that good uh, rugby style punt. He's he can punt it for fifty five yards and. You know, the old school coffin corner kick. They got a good long snapper. The punt coverage in the punt return game is still untested. When we lost um, uh, Tree Cohen a couple of years ago, is one of the more dynamic, shifty punt returners in the league. They right. haven't really been able to find one since. And they really, you know, they haven't found one yet. I think they only, you know, the Rams only punted once last week. And so they haven't identified who that returner is uh, going to be. They've gone through a couple of them, but, you know, like one return doesn't give you an indicator. And in the preseason, the punt coverage team was one of the worst in the NFL. And they haven't had that opportunity because the Bears didn't have any three and outs last week. And so they're still waiting to see how those two teams come together because, you know, uh, Doug Coletti, our statistician, who's one of the smartest numbers guy in the league, he always talks about the punt is the biggest play in the game. And I think with a lot of uncertainty with the Bears, that's still a the, probably the biggest question mark that has yet to be answered. Huh. He's right. Yeah. I mean, you can, you know, you flip field position 40 plus yards potentially every every punt does that's that's a big deal. So if you had to boil down, this is a final question, and certainly do appreciate you carving all the time you carve for us, Tom. I know you're busy and uh, this has been awesome. If you had to boil it down to Three musts, three keys from the Chicago Bears standpoint to win their home opener against the Cincinnati Bengals. What what would those be in your mind? 
Uh, you know, last week, Aaron Donald scared the game plan away from doing anything, any th vertical threats. They brought in Demir Bird and Marcus Goodwin that can run. Marcus Goodwin, number 84, pay attention to him because this dude can fly. If they don't get him the opportunity to take off the line of scrimmage and get a defensive back and a chasing opportunity, they're not going to they're not going to be a threat because everything was done underneath the two deepest safeties and the cornerbacks last week for the Rams and they never really presented that fear that they could go deep and make that big play. So it's going to have to be a game plan change of, of going downfield and become more threatening. And then but all I think all the talk and all the conversation is the defense and the defensive backfield. If they don't play more diligently, if they don't play a smarter game at the safety position with the receivers you have with Joe Burrow, that's going to be the biggest threat to uh, turning the home crowd on the Bears. If you let a, someone go down there and have get beyond both safeties, catch the ball, fall down, the safeties just run by them, they don't tap them down, Right. You're, you're going to see a really, really vicious turn of events coming from the fans in the stands. Interesting stuff. And, uh, really appreciate your, your, uh, your thoughts and, and, uh, how you see this football game, the bears and the Bengals. I'll tell you, it, it, it's very interesting. Nagy has lost every opener, but has never lost any other game in the month of September in his, in his three years as a, as a head coach. So, I mean, I, you know, what, I think he was nine and three going into the opener and lost, uh, lost the opener again, but boy, I, the, the rest of the month of September, the teams responded, bounced back and played darn well. Yeah. But you know, we, the, these group of guys, they don't know anything about the Bengals. I think the bears and the Bengals have only played like 12 times there. There's yeah. not a, I think it's 11, he's six and five uh, Bengals okay. are up to five. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, uh, we we've had bad experience against the Bengals, and as a broadcaster, I've had bad experience <laughs> against the Bengals. And so it's not like you know, it's not like Detroit or Minnesota or Green Bay or even you know they played the Rams the last four or five years in a row that we're right. familiar with them. Right. You know, we we know Joe Burrow from LSU and what he was able to do last year. And so I I think it's uh, a lot of these guys showing the discipline of taking their tablets home and start studying this opponent so they know him better. Good point. Good point. Tom, appreciate it very much. Look forward to catching up with you up there on the lake. What, what's the weather going to be like up there? It's going to be hot, Dave. You know, pack a, pack a, a white shirt because we are <laughs> going to be sweating. It's, I don't know, it's supposed to be like 88, 89 degrees. So I, I think it'll be warm. But you know what? I think a natural grass surface – it doesn't expose the heat as right. much as an artificial surface does. So it'll be, I, I would rather play on natural grass anytime as a cutting offensive lineman. So, you know, I, I'm, I, I think the atmosphere is going to be awesome. I hear that boy. I remember, you know, particularly AstroTurf with that heart, you know, you have one half an inch of, of, uh, of actual field and it's concrete or pavement underneath, man, wake up in the morning. It's like, I didn't really hit anybody to feel this sore, but that turf man just beat you to death. It's crazy. Oh, when crazy. you guys, you you guys used to wet down that Astro turf field, those hot games, and make that humidity come up through it. That was always the rumor that we heard on this end of your guys' stadium. <laughs> I'll tell you, boy, coming off the river, that humidity was thick. There's no question about it. Tom, look forward to seeing you in Chicago, man. Where where's the? I, I it's probably as good a town anywhere for restaurants where should i go uh if you want a good meal 100 percent of the time gibson's you know the, gibson's is is always great but gibson's owns about three restaurants right in that corner hugo's frog bar is right next door owned by the same people works out of the same kitchen they got carmine's which is kitty corner from it so you go into that area you're going to be guaranteed a good meal you or you know you could go to dublin's which is a tavern that you'll pay a third of the amount of money, but you'll get a meal equally as good. Yeah, that dog will hunt right there. Appreciate <laughs> that. Good information. Thanks a You're lot, welcome, Tom. Dave. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Hi, Dave Lapham here. Have you heard about In the Trenches with Dave Lapham presented by First Star Logistics? Catch new episodes from the world of sports and broadcasting. Search for In the Trenches with Dave Lapham on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts.